Welcome back, YouTubers. This is In the Northwest Native News. I'm your host, Jeff Ferguson, and we are back. Uh, it's a great day to be Indigenous. We have a lot of wonderful stories here. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties uh, early on, but uh, we have some great stories, and we're going to kind of keep things moving along. Um, one of the things we wanted to mention really quickly, uh, we have here in town, uh, if you're going to be heading into Spokane, that's what we're talking about, uh, the Ruby River Hotel. Now, we don't typically like to plug people uh, on the Ruby uh, here, but uh, the reason we're, we're talking about this is Jerry Dickers, he uh, has the Ruby River Hotel here in Spokane. He's offering tribal rates, so November 27th to the 28th. Uh, if you book directly, they start at $69. If you dine and stay, you get a $50 credit at the Osprey, and they remodeled that. I heard the food's amazing. I think you got a chance to go down there and eat. Yeah, the, the Ruby uh, River is right downtown uh, uh, on Division, on the river. It's beautiful. The view is beautiful along the river. Uh, recently, uh, the American Indian Community Center, we had our, our board and staff retreat there. Um, the food is delicious. They, they have barbecue. Um, and so I highly recommend, you know, we all got to come out and do a little bit of shopping. Uh, Christmas is right around the corner, I'm told. And uh, so I, I guess we better get after it and, and start getting some of the shopping done. Yeah. So um, that being said, moving right along, we have posted episode 13 out of R. Lee. We were uh, fortunate enough to make it out there to the R. Lee powwow and we got to see the jingle dress dancers. Um, it was pretty exciting. Uh, they had an Iron Woman jingle uh, dress contest out there, and they had they must have had probably 40 dancers out there to start with. Um, in episode 13, we just do highlights. We don't do it in the entirety, but we leave a link to the entire uh, dance off, which they go. We say 50, 52 songs, and or excuse me, 22, 22 songs, songs, 55 minutes, 55 minutes, and so yeah, I have to keep them straight. Holy cow, 55 songs. Boy, they'd, they'd still be going. Hey. Yeah. So, you know, we're all missing the pow powwow scene. You know, Yaman Suit is the drum in that episode. It's just amazing. You got the backup women singers standing right behind uh, the guys on the drum. And it's just beautiful. You know, our, our heart is yearning for powwow. And so here's a little bit of our powwow fix with that Iron Woman jingle special. Yeah, be sure to check that out. At the end of it, we do an interview with uh, the youngest competitor out there, uh, Daviana Madeira who had gone uh, 21 songs in 51 minutes. And uh, I think it was 21, or maybe, no, she did 19 songs in 51 minutes. And uh, we caught up with her in Elmo when we got to go over to Elmo and uh, she gives us some insight on what it was like to be out on that floor uh, with all of those iron women, you know? The big girls, yeah, yeah. an iron woman in the making. Pretty exciting. And also in that episode, we have a, a short uh, spot of the traditional round bustle. Uh, so you can see David Brown Eagle. Um, and then there's just a, a large number of, of jingle dress dancer girls. Um, shout out uh, to Sophie Turning Robe. Uh, and, and that's real exciting uh, to, to see some of the powwow. You know, we, we need to get our fix. Yeah, definitely. So moving right along here in Spokane, we had some things that had been happening. And this was something we covered a little bit earlier and have been working on. Um, but Wistock Sway. Uh, it used to have a name of a so, uh, of a, a U.S. Army Colonel, <sighs> Colonel <laughs> who was responsible for just let's just say some horrific things. I don't want to acknowledge that name again. Mm -hmm. I want to go with Wistox Way, and and it was exciting to be part of that. Um, we worked to get uh, kind of get the ball rolling, and I know Margo took the ball and ran with it and was going with all sorts of people, but they ran this article in the Spokesman Review. Uh, at the time when I uh, downloaded this, within a day, it had been liked 1,200 times, and it had been shared uh, a couple hundred times, but I thought I was pretty excited to see that they ran that. We've got some good coverage, and that that was that meeting was that Monday night. So Monday night, uh, the Spokane City Council uh, uh, reviewed the issue. Uh, uh, previously, about a couple months ago, uh, the Spokane Planning Commission had uh, uh, took up the had had a hearing uh, regarding changing the name. Uh, they they unanimously voted to change the name to Wist Talks Way and make that recommendation to the Spokane City Council. You know, this was really a grassroots effort, uh, natives and non-natives. You know, there was an art build. Uh, there were uh, 
projections on the courthouse, no honor and genocide by one of our Hopi friends, uh, Jacob Johns, and one of his uh, 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 counterparts. And then, you know, we, we had a rally uh, at, at the location, um, and, you know, a couple hundred people showed up. You know, we, we started off our rally with horses, and, and we brought it up with Harley, Harleys. Uh, we had Coeur d'Alene's, Yakima's, Colville's, Spokane's, just tribes from across the nation. But we also had our uh, uh, NAACP uh, representatives, you know, Muslims. There, there were Chinese professors from Spokane Falls Community College and EWU. So it was really widely supported across all of the groups. Um, it, it was just amazing. The Spokane Tribal Language House and Drums were there on site too. Yeah, that was pretty exciting. Um, in this article, they talk about some of the things that happened. Um, I'm just going to go through this really quickly. Uh, this is a direct quote. The Spokane tribe worked very hard to involve tribal elders and the tribes that were directly affected by the acts of Colonel George Wright, uh, said Margo Hill, a member of the Spokane <laughs> tribe of Indians and proponent of the new name. Um, goes on to say that Wright led a violent campaign against indigenous people to su suppress their resistance as white settlers spread across the land of the Yakima, Palouse, Coeur d'Alene, and Spokane tribes in the mid-19th century. The road will be named... Wistox Way in honor of Wistox, a woman warrior and Spokane Indian who played a role in the resistance against uh, Wright in 1858. Can you talk a little bit about what Wistox for us? So Wistox was a Spokane Indian woman that was married to Qualshan. She was a daughter of a chief and their union really solidified um, kind of the war structure. You know, tribes were very strategic in their alliances and they also did that marriage within families. So uh, Kual Shan was a Yakima and he came and he fought alongside the Spokane tribe. Um, and Wistox, she rode right into, uh, right alongside her husband. Uh, you know, she rode into battle and along, uh, she rode into uh, Colonel Wright's camp. Um, when they uh, began to commit some of the atrocities, uh, you know, she tried. She grabbed one of the knives and, and tried to bust her way free, um, and, and tried to you know get to free and her husband. Um, yeah, she you know got on her horse and uh, threw her spear in the ground. Uh, it, women warriors, you know, they were on the battlefield. Uh, they picked up wounded soldiers and rode them back to the medicine tent. Yeah. So you're trying to tell me. <laughs> That they're naming this road after this woman. <laughs> well, it's about damn time. Yeah. Hey, gosh, holy cow! When we look around at the patriarchal, the colonialistic mentality that's been here for hundreds of years, to have this happen is exciting. When I oh, in the beginning of this uh, episode, we we talk about it's a great day to be indigenous. You know, there's so many amazing things going on in this country and this is just one of them. This is a local one. When we look at a national level, things were happening. Uh, Columbus statues were toppling. Um, we look at, at, at people like, like Deb Holland and we look at Sharice Davis uh, that, that are out there uh, at the forefront in DC working that end of it. And then we have uh, something, you know, and it's created this ripple effect. And that, uh, uh, this is what I mean by ripple effect. Within 24 hours of the city council announcing that here in Spokane, the Spokane County, they announced um, in this, well, they, they announced that the Spokane County was renaming Hangman Valley Golf Course, which was whole, which was part of that era. And this story ran on Creme 2 News. Um, Spokane, Washington on Tuesday uh, announced that it would be renaming Hangman Valley Golf Course at, uh, to Latah Creek Golf Course. The county uh, department board of commissioners unanimous, unanimously voted um, to, to the name change, according to county spokesperson uh, Jared Webley. The decision came after several months of meeting and deliberation between the Golf Advisor Committee, where they followed a very in intentional process to consider historical and, and or cultural significance of a property, according to Webley. So that is exciting. So it's one thing, and then we're seeing these ripple effects or butterfly effect, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. um, that have been happening. Uh, and it's really, really exciting. So. Um, that being said, one thing I've been forgetting to mention, we would like to have a name for our morning show other than the morning show. And it doesn't necessarily have to be something like teepee talk or anything like, or tuli mat talk. <laughs> um, but if you guys have any su suggestions, if you have any suggestions for a new name, be sure to, to, to put them in the uh, comment section below and we'll just keep working on that. So uh, another thing we've been trying to keep an eye on, I've got a, a day five now uh, since they announced that the first vaccines were uh, uh, 
released in the United Kingdom. We got him over here in Seattle, I think, was it yesterday? Uh, not, not, not here in Seattle, but we got him over there in Seattle, here in the state of Washington, I think it was yesterday. So we're gonna keep an eye on that to see how long before we get our frontline um, IHS workers and, and people in Indian country that, that need them uh, before we get the first vaccine. So anyhow, moving right along. What, what do you think about that? Well, I'm, I'm excited, you know, uh, we were out delivering beadwork and picking up beadwork. <laughs> so I didn't get the latest on that last night, uh, you know, talking to reporters and stuff, but I'm excited for the vaccine. You know, I have little yayas that I haven't been able to visit, um, you know, uh, my, my niece's kids and, and I haven't been able to visit the little ones. And so it's been a road, this COVID is a real challenge. Um, yeah. So, you know, with COVID, it's changed a lot of different things. And one of the things we want to do real quick is we here uh, uh, from the Spokane tribe, we have a quick shout out. We have, you can see them on the far right there. We had uh, Casey, Casey Winecoop got uh, to be part of this. Changer adapts Coast uh, Salish and Dakota origin stories into a radio play. Now this ran in the Seattle Times. I was pretty excited about that for Casey and his crew. Um, I know that, uh, that uh, Fern Renville was a big part of this. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I know you got to read a little bit more into that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so they were doing original uh, origin stories. Uh, you know, some of our, our tribal stories. Uh, uh, Casey was playing the coyote. And, you know, they had a beautiful script and a lot of work. Um, you know, uh, I, I think Lower Elwha was involved at tribal members. And um, they, you know, this was going to be a theater production. But because of COVID, um, they've had to take this to a radio show. Um, and so the, they had done, they've done a really good job in, in taking some of these origin stories and, and making a script um, and bringing it live on the radio. Yeah, it's pretty exciting to see. It says they had, like you said, the uh, Lower Elwha, which is uh, one of our tribes from the, the western side over on the peninsula. Um, it says the set designer, Tomer Peterson, uh, had Mati. even M Mati, mm -hmm. uh, had even planned on using real materials on the set, like a canoe on loan from the Tulalip tribe, and fresh kelp and seaweed from the from Tulalip Bay uh, from Tulalip Bay to bring in the smell of the ocean. That would have been really exciting, but they, you know, because of COVID, they had to adapt, and a lot of us are adapting. Um, and I think it's pretty neat to be able to see this and keep people, you know, in a positive. You know, we're, this too shall pass. You know, this isn't something that's going to dictate the rest of our lives. It's just taking a little, little bit longer to get a grip on it than I think we initially thought. But this is a really cool idea. I know Fern is an amazing woman. And Casey, I really want to check this out. This is exciting. So look for The Changer. Um, it's a radio play. Um, and you should be able to find that. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and leave the streaming uh, link to it in, in the, the comments below. Um, so look for that. Uh, uh, yeah. The, the season uh, changes and the star people. So look for that play. Yeah, we'll definitely leave the link for that. So moving right along, quick shout out to another amazing native woman, Patsy Whitefoot. They showed her uh, with the uh, Washington electorals uh, casting votes uh, for Biden and Harris. And they showed her in the Spokesman Review. Uh, if you don't know Patsy Whitefoot, she's an amazing Yakima woman that has been involved in education for Golly, I think she told me 35 years or something like that. I got the opportunity to interview her uh, for uh, Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians. Um, I guess it's been a couple years now down in Portland, but man, gosh, somebody who has, her heart is all in for Indian people. It's really neat when you get a chance to meet people like that. Super exciting. So so shout out to, to Patsy Whitefoot, but I know she was, well, I'll let you talk about, we'll move into the bigger picture stuff, but I, I want some comments. What's your experience been with Patsy? So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Electoral College. Sure, we'll so, move into that, but what's your what's your thoughts on Patsy? Oh, Patsy is Patsy. amazing. You know, Patsy uh, is from the Yakima Nation. Uh, she's a tribal elder that, you know, walks her talk. You know, she has been an educator for 30, 40, 50 years on the Yakima Indian Reservation. She, you know, during this time of COVID, she's got her grandchildren that she's homeschooling right in her home today. She also has the little swans. Um, her and um, some of her counterparts are uh, helping, uh, you know, bring up young uh, Yakima uh, girls in the Yakima culture. And the little swans are, are, 
you know, they they dance, they sing, they it's amazing. So uh, we we admire Patsy a great deal. One of the things that Patsy's been working on very passionately also is the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women movement. I know that she's been really involved in that too. So Yeah, Patsy helped get legislation. Uh, her sister actually went missing 30 years ago. And so uh, in, in Yakima County has one of our largest numbers of murdered, missing Indigenous women and people. And so she's been a strong advocate and helped get legislation passed right here in Washington. Yeah, she's exciting. I always, I, I, she makes me smile. Even just hearing her name makes me smile because I know where her heart is. And she was just, when I interviewed her, she was just, just really warm hearted the whole time. So that was really exciting. So moving right along to your national level stuff, uh, Native uh, elector, electors help Biden, uh, help seal Biden win. Now, I know that you know a little bit about this, um, but I see that they have some pretty uh, heavy hitters in there. You're looking at, uh, the um, Gila River, the Gila River governor is in there. Yeah, um, so the Electoral College formally chose Joe Biden and Pamela Harris um, on Monday as part of the nation's uh, next uh, presidential ticket. Uh, you know, uh, looking at the news coverage from Indian Country Today, you know, they gave them a solid electoral majority of 306 votes. At least eight of those people were native indigenous people across three states. Um, and uh, they cast their electoral, electoral votes in favor of Joe Biden. In Arizona, three of the state's 11 electors uh, were native. The Gila River Indian Community, Governor Stephen Lewis, uh, Navajo Nation uh, President Jonathan Nez, and Tohono O'odham uh, National Nation Chairman Ned Norris Jr. Uh, so that was really exciting to have that uh, uh, tribal delegation. But I will mention, Jeff, right here in the state of Washington, Two of the 12 electors were Native American. Uh, Native American caucus chair, Julie Johnson, Auntie Julie, we call her, um, uh, from the Lummi Nation, served as electoral vote, and Native American caucus member, Patsy Whitefoot, from the Yakima Nation, they cast their votes. Yeah, that's that's really cool to hear. You know, I got to meet I, uh, Julie Johnson down there at uh, NCAI when I was down there with Yvette Joseph uh, last year, and I uh, got to meet Julie. And, what an amazing woman. Another amazing woman. You know, uh, I teach tribal governance at Eastern Washington University, and I actually had uh, Julie Johnson come and speak to my class about uh, elections and natives and the vote, get out the vote. And then I also had President Stephen Lewis from the Gila River Indian Community uh, visit with my class. You know, these tribal leaders are so busy, but they are gracious with their, t with their time when it comes to the next generation. Yeah. Uh, so moving right along, we have had some issues here and this is kind of an exciting story in, in a few different ways but this is what I, I saw this came out in the spokesman review and by the way uh the spokesman review has been doing a lot of indigenous stories a lot of things i know they they had that uh, new reporter that they hired uh to cover uh, i guess multicultural or well actually they just got the funding for that position mm -hmm. and they're looking to hire so if anybody out there knows uh folks that could cover uh, issues for people of color, um, be sure and inquire about that job. Bill should be posting. Yeah, so that's exciting. They have stepped their game up a little bit, and it looks like they need some help. But this story is uh, from the Coeur d'Alene tribe. Uh, again, it ran in the Spokesman Review. Coeur d'Alene tribe races to connect citizens to Internet before deadline Congress uh, has failed to extend. Um, when Valerie Fasthorse became the Coeur d'Alene tribe's IT director in 1999, she said people couldn't even get dial-up internet connection on the reservation. Uh, Fasthorse worked for more than two decades to connect uh, residents of North Idaho uh, reservation to the internet, uh, starting the tribe's own internet service provider, Red Spectrum Communications, which now serves the majority of households. But the arrival of COVID and the shift toward online life exposed um, Online Life exposed the need to upgrade aging infrastructure of the bandwidth uh, required for work, school, and doctor's visits for home. And in March, um, the federal government passed $3 million, excuse me, $3 trillion in CARES Act money, uh, a relief package that sent $150 billion to state, local, and tribal governments to cover costs related to the pandemic. Now, Idaho Commerce Department uh, passed on more than $2 million of that money to the uh, Coeur d'Alene tribe. Uh, as part of a $49 billion uh, broadband grant program. And that federal funding, funding um, has to be spent by December 30th. And in order to get that up and going, it's, it's created an influx. 
So um, what's happened is with all these people needing broadband now, uh, all these reservations and rural communities, uh, the companies that uh, typically in, do the installations on that have just been slammed. And so Fast Horse goes on to stay in this article. She says, we're struggling. We're really, or we're just really on the edge here. Um, and this was on the, the 14th. Their deadline was actually set for the 15th for them to get the, these contracts going and the money had to be spent. So they had to be paid out by December 30th. And so on that, she says, we're, we're just really on the edge here. We think we're pushing the 15th. So on the eve of the deadline, which would have been the 14th, the department granted a last minute extension until Friday. Now Fast Horse and her team are racing to connect as many families as possible. Um, it goes on to state that Fast Horse said that, or that um, one of the broadband uh, companies, it says the tribe received grants for three projects, but only two got off the ground after contractors suddenly busy amid a glut of, of broadband projects around the state told Fast Horse the other project would be impossible to finish by the deadline. The project, she said, would have connected 163 homes and approved service for seven more. The deadline uh, is what scared a lot of them away, is what she says. Um, one said, if, if even if there's a, an extension, they they or if there was an extension, they put a bid on the contract, but they just couldn't do it right now. That's just, and, and we're seeing that all over the place where these people that do that type of work they're swamped, you know, and, it, and it's not just the installers of broadband. It's also stretching into um, people like carpenters and plumbers and electricians and all these different things. But that's what happened on the Coeur d'Alene Res. It's a good article, so we'll leave a link on that. And so it really goes to show um, that we have to do our planning. When projects are shovel ready, uh, then we have a, a greater likelihood to have them ready to go uh, when the funding becomes available. Often that's what happens, uh, funding becomes available for a short and limited time. Uh, you know, that's happening at tribes across the Northwest. Um, I know that some tribes were having to turn the money back uh, to the Department of Revenue. Uh, so when you are out there, uh, planning is important. Of course, I'm a, a professor in urban and regional planning, and so I, I believe in the importance. But if you have planners that are, are uh, penciling out the projects and, and making it so the infrastructure, uh, when the funding comes, it's ready to go. Shovel ready is the, is the way to go. And when we talk about shovel ready, good example of that real quick is uh, the uh, Spokane tribe uh, put together the... Um, they're uh, cozy. The uh, solar panels. Yeah, yeah, the solar panel. The the um, solar panel initiative that they did with Wells Fargo. Now this is a five million dollar project that was shovel ready. And when Wells Fargo announced that they were going to give fifty million dollars to Indian Country, the Spokane Tribe put in for that and got five of that fifty million dollars. And so they had a big celebration out there on the res. And the lady that that represents Indigenous communities to Wells Fargo came out and gifted the tribe. And it was a it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but it all goes back down to planning. And so and it's a combination of things. It's not just the planning, but also a big part of that, you know, goes back to like we were saying in earlier episodes, uh, elections. When you get out there and vote and you vote for people on a local level that are are non-native allies and get them in positions of power, then we can get the ball moving and then we can get things going. And these are some things that got going. So uh, moving right along. Speaking of the Spokane when we, yeah, when we talk about internet, um, yesterday on the front of the newspaper, also the Spokesman Review ran a story about the inter internet challenges, the digital divide in Indian country, and the challenges that our students and our teachers face. Yeah, so the article, uh, it's, it's entitled, Despite Internet Challenges, Teachers, Parents, and Students on the Spokane Reservation Go Extra Mile to Make Remote Learning uh, Work. Uh, that's what the, the, the title of the uh, photograph says. But they go on and, and they, they talk about how difficult it's been for rural communities. And this particular one is on the Spokane Reservation. And how they're having to use uh, paper packets and hand deliver them and hand deliver lunches out, out because uh, without internet access, these kids have to, you know, they have to keep up with their, their uh, curriculum and they have to keep up with their studies. And without having, you know, they, they were saying uh, on, on the Coeur d'Alene they couldn't even get dial up. And I know on the Spokane Res, some of them are pretty rural, and the dial-up is so slow. You know, if you can imagine not being able to uh, maybe check your email and your Facebook at the same time or not even be able to, to load a Facebook page, you know, that's that's crazy. Um, the federal government stepped in in Congress, uh, passed the $3 trillion. Spokane invested $4.7 in broadband project, and things are moving along. they got the jetpacks and all sorts of stuff out there. 
Yeah, so I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, not only Welpinit teachers, but our teachers that drive out to our reservations every day or live on the reservations. You know, they are having to do paper packets and then they record their Zoom lectures, record them, put them on a thumb drive and then send them out to the kids that don't have internet. That's a lot of extra work. I'm an educator and it's really hard just to have your curriculum, you know, uh, and ready to go and teach it, let alone recording it and thumb driving it and getting shipped out and keeping track. You know, there's 400 kids in some cases, uh, double that in other places. And so it's really uh, it's really hard on our, our, uh, our education system and, and it's hard for our kids to learn in those kind of environments. It's really taking this stuff uh, COVID stuff to uh, uh, it's a whole nother step beyond online learning because as educators you're forced from the the coronavirus to move into online education and then when the online education isn't working then you're forced to, to do your curriculum all over again and the kids are forced to try to keep up with all of this stuff you know it's hard enough you know trying to do it on in the normal school and then much less online or much less with these paper packets and maybe if you get a little uh, internet access through uh, online or through a jetpack. I know the jetpacks are still spotty, you know. They're still working on, I heard they got a couple towers up there on the Spokane Res. So that's really exciting. We'll leave the link in this article in the Spokesman Review in the comment section below, so. Yeah, uh, you know, we had uh, families, the older brother taking the little brother and sister up to the Powell grounds just to get a little bit of interconnect, internet connection. Uh, but hopefully we get those two towers up and, um, uh, and and hopefully these vaccines start rolling down in, in Indian country. Yeah, well, hopefully. We'll see. Moving right along, we are doing a quick shout out to Chad Yellowjohn. Uh, he's one of our tribal members that is an artist who is a, a graduate of the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, and he has got... Uh, political influence in his art, and I saw this one popped up on the, uh, his Facebook page the other day, so I just wanted to share this one. It's called Eat Poo, Chief Wahoo, and if you notice, it's kind of got the Chucky theme going on, and it's got Chief Wahoo, and he's got the scissors out, and he's going to put an end to them, and uh, for those of you that may not have heard, um, the Cleveland Indians uh, announced that they would no longer be using their racist mascot, and this is something that has been um, in the works for literally decades. Um, there was an article that ran. Um, this article here was from the uh, Time Magazine. And I'm pretty excited that they ran it in Time Magazine. Cleveland baseball team reportedly dropped Indians, uh, Indians name after 105 years. That's a long time. 105 years. Could you imagine how, how, what an institution that they've created around this racist mascot? Um, but it's, it's change. You know, and, and these kind of things, again, goes back to non-native allies and it goes back to the resilience and the persistence of Indian people. And amidst the COVID, we have been able to do a lot of things. It's kind of crazy how, how many things have been able to been, be accomplished just this last year. Um, this article goes on and it, and it, it says that um, citing three people familiar with the decision, the New York Times reported uh, Sunday night that the time or the team is moving away from a name considered racist for decades. The Indians have been uh, in, internally discussing a potential name change for months. And so this actually ran in the Associated Press. And I wanted to show, too, that it wasn't just there, but it was also going into it made it into this uh, New York Times and just made it all over the place. And um, yeah, so it's positive movement right you know it's it's controversial um you know we are not mascots uh you know sometimes we take pride in if there's indians or or uh, you know some mascots that uh you know proudly represent our people whether it's the spokane chiefs or the spokane indians but the problem is is that some of these ball clubs uh really have mascots, mascots that are offensive, and then their fans, you know, think they can wear headdresses and war paint and, you know, make, uh, you know, noises, and that's really not uh, our culture, or it's not it's cultural appropriation, and it's like, it feels mocking, uh, so it ends up being really offensive to us if, if folks didn't, you know, try to dress up and be those things. Then I don't think it would be such a, a hard issue for us but but it is because uh, people don't uh, treat us very well and it's it's been that way for a long time we're talking 105 years you know i read an article um 
I was going through some archives a while back, and this was just, this was maybe five years ago I saw this article, and it ran, I think the newspaper was out of San Francisco, and it was about 1920, and they were still offering, they offered $5 for a, a native Indian scalp, $10 for a native woman scalp, and $20 for a male scout and it was an advertisement in the paper in, in California for these and that was just now about a hundred years ago um, so the mentality has changed you know but if you look at a bigger picture um, there's there's a lot of things that can change and this this the Cleveland Indians having that happen we also had the Washington Redskins this year which was really exciting so there's the balls moving in in the right direction and I it, it's been equated a lot of different ways but I think the person that that summed it up best for me we got the opportunity to go down um, last uh, last September to Santa Fe and we met with this amazing woman Charlene Teeters uh, she's a Spokane tribal member she's an artist She's an activist. She's the former Dean of Students at the Institute of American Indian Arts. She's a Spokane tribal member. And she tells a story of what got her into this. Um, she actually led the fight back in the early, excuse me, the late 80s and early 90s um, against racist mascots uh, for professional teams. She worked with uh, uh, Dennis Banks and Clyde Belcourt and uh, Gay Kingman. We got to meet Gay Kingman down at... Uh, Niga down in yeah. San Diego a couple years ago, another amazing woman. But she, Charlene Teeters worked with these people, some of the uh, AIM, AIM founders uh, with the National uh, uh, Congress of American Indians and went around to the stadiums to protest all of these different racist mascots. 30 years ago she was doing this. She was fighting the fight and one of the stories that she tells, we have episode 14 uh, that's coming up It'll be online here in about 20 minutes, and uh, it's an amazing interview. She gave me a, a solid hour, and she tells the story of how she went from going to uh, Illinois to get an MFA in art. So she was, a, she was a local Native artist who had been to Institute of American Indian Art. She went with George Flett and George Hill and those guys. She refers to them as her colleagues. So she talks about her colleagues. So she goes from there. She goes to Illinois to get a MFA, in, you know, a Master's of Fine Arts. And when she got there, she realized what a racist environment that was built around the the, the university's mascot. She talks. She tells a story of going into the into this one bar um, where the the uh, fraternities gathered, and there was a neon sign of a of a drunken Indian falling down over and over again. And it's just a really heart-wrenching, heart-filled interview. I've done hundreds of interviews, and this is probably, I would say, this is top two. This is, this is at least top three, probably top two interviews I've ever done. And I've interviewed some, some pretty heavy hitters, and she's just amazing. But she tells a story going to get that MFA, the experience that she did, what led her. Because before that, her art wasn't political. And so that's what changed her. And she got into po political art and she went from the, she ended up getting her MFA and she tells a story of going through that, working with Dennis Banks and, and working with Clyde Belcourt and those guys going around to the different stadiums, all the, the confrontations that they had with SWAT teams and, and protesters and, and, you know, the, the, the team owners and all that. And she talks about what it's like as an Indian student as an educator doing this, what it's like as a mother to experience that, have your children experience that. She says that when she got into that fight, she was thrown to the front lines and she was getting all sorts of horrific mail and, and packages and phone calls and all. She tells that story. She opens her heart to me. It's an awesome story. If you, if you haven't, if you don't watch any of our episodes, watch episode 14. You won't regret it definitely it's it's exciting and it'll be up online here in about 20 minutes so yeah i'm really looking forward to seeing charlene teeters you know she's an amazing as you mentioned dean of iaia um you know we jeff and i uh travel a lot and we had the opportunity to go down there and visit um the indian uh, school, the Institute of American Indian Arts. I we highly recommend if your children are artists or if they're writers, go check it out. It's a beautiful campus. You know, in fact, it, uh, Jeff, we'll have to show some pictures of the campus um, and tell you maybe a little bit about their program. You know, we're all about education here um, at Inland Northwest Native News, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that interview with Charlene. Um, you know, we've, we've uh, done some interviews and uh, we have more coming. 
so uh, we were real excited to finally get out the Iron Woman jingle dress um, and the interview with Daviana. And then now, Charlene, I mean, the hits just keep coming. Uh, you know, we've got more stories coming up with Francis Ald, uh, Indian ventriloquist, um, one of our tribal elder, Kootenai elders up at Elmo. And so there's just lots of great things happening in Indian country. I know we're on lockdown just a little bit longer, and hopefully those vaccinations will be coming out. Yeah, so I one thing I wanted to mention just real quickly, I showed this uh, this earlier, um, this Chief uh, Wahoo. So this, again, was John, uh, Chad Yellowjohn. We'll leave the link to his website uh, in the comment section below. <clears throat> but I wanted to bring that up because uh, Chad was a student of the Institute of American Indian Arts, and he was there when Charlene was there. And I, I'm almost certain that she had some influence on his work going political. And he's got some amazing political art. If you check out his website, uh, if you actually, if you go back into uh, our uh, YouTube uh, channel and look back, we did an interview with Chad Yellowjohn, and he highlights a bunch of the work that he did and the piece that I got from him that well that you got for me from him uh, is in there and it's just definitely worth checking out so there's a link to that um I don't have the well if you look in the the I had, do have the link to his website but if you check out in in the YouTube channel back in the archives I think it's like episode four it's one of the early ones we do a, a good interview with Chad Yellowjohn he talks about that and what it's like to go to IAIA so I, yeah. I don't I don't know if you have any more stories Jeff um, but we'd like to give a shout out to Francis Kluya. It's his birthday today, and I know Jeff. He's one of your special friends. He gifted you a bustle. Um, you know, why don't you give a, a birthday wish to Francis Kluya? Oh man, happy birthday, Francis! What a blessing to have a man like you in all of our lives. You know, it's you know we do we worked on the the the. Um, the prairie chicken special. So if you, I don't know if you got a chance to see that online. There was a contest, and me and uh, I, I did the uh, Calcutta for him uh, live down at Northern Quest in the back, in, in the back theater there. But Francis and and uh, David Madera, Davy Madera, and uh, um, oh Tawny. So we all worked on this together, and that was really exciting. So every time I get a chance to spend some time with Francis, it's time well spent, man. So happy birthday! Thank you again for my eagle bustle. I couldn't have asked. Here, give, give you a quick story. I asked Francis. I said, Francis, I'm, I'm, I want to start dancing. Um, and I don't have a bustle. Can you help me round up some feathers? And so he thought about it. And I ran into him. And he didn't say anything. And I ran into him again. And he still didn't say anything. And it must have been like six months later or something. We ran into him at, up at the powwow up, at, up in Usk on the Kalispell Res. And he said, you know, I want to talk to you. I've been thinking about this. And I've got this old eagle bustle that I want to gift you. And it's really, it's exciting because it was a, it was a, a champion dancer's bustle that was, it was the inner bustle. So there was a, bu a, a, a champion dancer by the name of Wally Paul back in the 70s. I think, I think Francis said he got this bustle gifted to him. It was the inner bustle of Wally Paul's double bustle. Wally Paul gifted it to him in like 1973 or 74. And then Francis turned around and gifted it to me. What an honor. Happy birthday, Francis, man. I really appreciate that. And I hope you have a wonderful day. And I hope to get to see you soon, man. So thank you for, yeah, thank yeah. you for that. Appreciate it. I have the outro ready. You have, all right. Well, uh, that being said, we are going, I think that's it. Thank you once again for joining us. Um, if you have any questions or comments, oh, real quickly, uh, we had a, a name con, uh, we had a suggestion from Danielle. Shout out to Danielle. Thanks for, for chiming in. Uh, she says, I always liked Moccasin Telegraph. Uh, maybe in the Salish language. Maybe we get that <laughs> translated. That could be, we, we could get that. So we're still looking for names for our morning show. So they, shout out to Danielle. Thank you. So uh, with that being said, tune in. Lem we'll lips. we'll be in on Friday. We'll see you on Friday. Yeah, shout out.